Thanks everybody for coming out to Uncanny View X Men, uh, which is my talk about the X Men. So strap in. Uh, it's the one non development talk at Development Denver. Uh, we are talking about Vue X today, state management within Vue.js. Uh, we won't talk a lot about specifically Vue as much as how state management works within Vue. Uh, I'm Isaac Miller, uh, the reason I'm in front of you today. Uh, so I actually come from a pretty non-traditional tech background. I played drums in a touring band and uh, was a radio DJ throughout most of my 20s uh, until going to Galvanize a few years ago. And I actually got to teach at Galvanize uh, after graduation. You'll notice all those folks on the right. Uh, every single one of them at least talked to Develop Denver this year, if not basically put the whole thing together in the case of Kyle Coverley. From there, uh, I moved on to a, uh, a company called Vertifor. They do uh, what's called agency management systems in the insurance agency, uh, industry, and I was working on the content management system that backed all of that. And then from there, I moved to a consultancy called Pervite, which was my first experience with Vue uh, about a year and a half ago, um, and, and got to dive in on what that was, association membership management system. So for trade associations, unions, stuff like that, ma managing all their members and, and different events and whatnot. And now, I work for Enquire Solutions, which uh, does for senior living and, and post-acute healthcare, it's a, a customer relationship management system. So you might have heard, as I said, management system uh, a whole lot within that. Uh, and that, that is because it's sort of become my bread and butter. And when you're working within management systems, regardless of what the content actually is, uh, you end up working with a lot of different entities and needing to map those together, which is where state management comes in. So why state management? Well, first of all, working on the front end without good state management definitely makes you feel like you're going to pass out. And your app, your app is always going to have state, even if it's just, let's load a page, and there's no buttons, nothing after that, you still have the pages not loaded, the pages loaded. So we always have to deal with state in some way, shape, or form. Having good state management allows you to separate managing data versus presenting data. A lot of times, we get those worlds kind of overlapping and leading into each other, and that's where it becomes very hard to debug and hard to write extensible code. And then finally, your state becomes visible and predictable. There's a lot of things that happen in the front end. We all love JavaScript, but it was written in 10 days. So there's a lot that happens that you may not actually see happening, and state management kind of helps organize all that chaos. It puts you in charge. So this talk, uh, if you have worked in Vue before and you're experienced like Rihanna and know what you're doing at, at the keys, hopefully this talk will still be helpful uh, just looking at, at how UX does state management and talking about state management at a higher level. Uh, but if you're like TI and you've never touched state management, never touched Vue, uh, I hope to at least give you a good intro and, and still give you some basics to, to jump off from. So today we're going to talk, again, state management basics just to kind of get into the flow of what state management is. Uh, before diving into uh, the anatomy of the UX score, uh, we'll talk about the score pattern and what that means. Component binding helpers, this is a big part of UX and what makes your life really easy within UX. It's mapping stuff within your store to your components. We'll do a demo and then, uh, as time allows, we'll try to get to a QA. So, state management. First of all, what is state? I, I imagine uh, you know, a lot of people they might hear about state management, especially with. React and Redux, but not exactly know what we're talking about with that. Uh, the UX docs calls it the single source of truth that drives the app. Uh, I also like Raquel Moss's definition uh, that it's the outcome of all actions the user has taken since the page is loaded. She admits in, in, in that kind of intro article uh, that that's missing parts of the story, especially stuff that you know the server is sending up by default that the user doesn't interact with. But it's kind of a good place to start thinking of it really as as just this uh, kind of single object that that contains all of the knowledge about what's happening in our app. So before it was really messy. It was really tough to do state management before we had state management libraries. We used our good friend jQuery. Uh, we used it all over the place for all sorts of things, which honestly jQuery is still very powerful, but now with VanillaJS having element uh, accessibility and different ways to access state, we don't, we don't need to use jQuery anymore. You get into a lot of spaghetti code like this. And then eventually, Facebook created Flux. Now, Flux isn't actually its own state management library. It's, it's more of a design pattern uh, to represent one-way data flow. If you ever worked with, with Angular, uh, that's it's two-way data mining. So that's kind of one of the, the main differences there. So in Flux, we have kind of four different uh, concepts within our architecture. Uh, uh, the dispatcher is kind of the, the, 
go between for everything. It's, it's both taking in uh, actions and, and sending out uh, updated data. Uh, actions are, are the helper methods that, that kind of tell the dispatcher what to do. Uh, stores hold on to our data, and then controller views, originally when Flux was created, the idea was stores would hold on to this data, pass them to components, components would then pass them down to child components as props, which is nice, but I think anyone who's dealt with props, the first time you try to pass something back up or pass something to a sibling, things start to get real weird, which is why we broke out of that pattern. We're in the nerd zone now, so if you're, if you're not ready for state management, I'm sorry, we have lovely big heads. Uh, <laughs> We're, we're going to nerd out a little bit. So state management libraries usually use a store pattern, uh, and that, that breaks, basically breaks down to just your data, uh, straight up that single state object that we'll talk about a lot, how to access that data, and then how that data gets manipulated. So right from the view, view docs is kind of a very simple, uh, but I think easy to kind of grasp uh, uh, conceptually diagram where we have this store, it, it manages our shared state, uh, if, if there is an update to, to our state, it'll send that out to our components, and as we see at the bottom, our components can also send actions to notify the store that that state needs to be updated. So in Vuex, we, we have all those things happening uh, with, with basically your Vuex store, the, the first four, uh, state getters, mutations, and actions, you're going to find in every single Vuex store, and then uh, modules allow us to break up our stores in ways that are kind of semantically uh, more intelligent and gives us a nice, clean, organized code. Our example project is I show some code snippets and we get to the uh, demo. is a similar little thing I, I made called Dinner using the Zomato API. It's Tinder for restaurants. That's what we're doing today. Uh, we're going to swipe left, swipe right on some restaurants. Uh, it's going to be uh, a good time, hopefully. So first off, state. Uh, state is, again, it's, it's the single object that contains all your application state. So if you're if you can think of it as, as kind of the, the root folder on your computer in, in kind of the way that a file directory is a tree, this is what happens with state. It's, you have this base root node and then everything sort of trickles down from there. So within our auth module, we're going to have very basic, don't actually put this off into a real life application auth, uh, but we will you know, have username and password using some Firebase stuff. So I've got a user object that I'm going to initialize with the, the fields that I know I want to use. Uh, very similar to computed properties that way. Um, and then I also just have a Boolean, so if I want a component that just needs to know are we authenticated, but I don't really want that component to know anything about the user itself, uh, I've got this, this other Boolean. Your state knows everything about your app, which is really great. It's, it's a very powerful thing. But because of that, manipulating state directly uh, can be really dangerous. You're, you're able to do it, but it's risky. So we have some of our other helper things, starting with getters. Getters let us uh, define how state gets access. So we can, state, uh, we can access state properties directly, just like a normal object, as we're used to. So we have our user objects, and we just directly call user.uid.displayName.email to get those properties. We can also treat getters like computed properties, calculating new values that don't actually exist within the state object and kind of use them as we need them. So we're going to have different lists within our application, uh, the restaurants that we've seen, the restaurants that we liked, and the restaurants that we disliked. So here, there's going to be a need for, I just want the IDs of the restaurants of that list. And so instead of rewriting that in every component, I just have a getter that maps it to just the IDs. Uh, just like computer properties in view, uh, it might seem expensive to do that calculation all the time, but uh, it, it checks off all the dependencies of that getter, and it only re-triggers that, that getter when the dependencies have changed. So otherwise, you're going into the cache. It's not that expensive of a, a calculation to do. Mutations, uh, mutations are the only way that we can change state within uh, UX, where, where we really want to uh, sort of abstract that away from the state object in and of itself. Again, just because it's risky to change state directly. We can kind of think of mutations similar to, to how a lot of state management was done uh, back in the day, which was through, through event handling. So a mutation is similar to the handler of an event, uh, and, and the way that we, we fire off that mutation is with a commit. Uh, and we'll, we'll see that uh, when we talk about actions uh, a little bit more. So our mutations for, for off again, we're, we're going to log out, which basically just resets uh, our, our user store, our off store. Uh, we can also, when we log in, we can set the user. This will let us change the user to if we 
want for whatever reason without, without a logout step. Um, and then we, we have a, a way to set that rule so that we can sort of control those things separately. Um, mutations do follow use reactivity rules, which is really nice. If you want to be cognizant of, of if you know that you're going to need an object's properties, defining a, a default value for that. Um, and then if you're adding properties using stuff like object.assign or view.set uh, to be able to, to trigger those updates. But otherwise, your components will listen for changes and, and you don't have to write anything manually uh, to have that data update. Uh, because of that, though, mutations do need to be synchronous. We want to abstract out uh, any sort of asynchronous calls because then the, the whole point of a mutation is that I can send out that commit and know that, that instantly that state is updated. So if I have an async call, now I've got different phases of state, and I don't exactly know what that value is. But we're not exactly going to move away from asynchronous programming in JavaScript anytime soon, which is why we have actions. Actions have two jobs. Uh, they perform the business logic operations, usually asynchronously. There's a couple occasions where, where you, know, you might just be wrapping a promise in something that you don't need to, so you don't have to worry about it. But generally, it's going to be async. And then they commit mutations. So all of our business logic is going to happen within uh, an action rather than a mutation. So Firebase is a little bit weird with its auth. There's kind of this extra, extra step of, of uh, on auth state change that you have to fire. So we can really think of login and check user status as sort of part of the same action because uh, immediately check user, check user status will get fired uh, when login is done. And then our, our, our logout method is just as simple. We sign out and then we commit logout. We can also get more complex again. We can, we can have kind of more business logic. So here, uh, Firebase, when we create a user, just wants the email and password. But I want to be able to have a display name of my user. So once I've created that user, we then, uh, starting on, on line six, uh, we update the profile of that user. Uh, and then our collections, our, our different lists, are all going to be hidden behind a user ID, so I create that in my uh, Firestore as well. So I do these extra two other steps after creating a user, but it's all happening within the same action. Actions are really powerful because they can, through uh, what's uh, getters and root getters, um, call anything else within the VueX store. So they can call sibling, sibling stores, the parent store, um, they, they, they directly access uh, both getters and actions and mutations, so you can kind of control everything through actions. Then finally, uh, modules are, are just a nice way to, to, to split things up, because at scale, uh, we already saw a bunch of different things within just an auth store, and so if we're doing that for every single thing in our application, that, that store file is going to get to be you know, tens of thousands of lines long. It's going to be doing too much, and we want it to do less. We want all these stores, just like components, to be Simple, uh, easy to understand if I'm looking at a file structure, just go, cool, that's what this thing does. Uh, and, and really just broken apart again semantically, so you have that nice separation of concerns, each, each store kind of doing specifically what you want it to do. And they are, uh, they are just like substores. So it's, it's, you have uh, state, getters, mutations, actions. It's, it stores all the way down. Uh, so you can kind of mess stuff as deeply as you want. So our root store uh, in, in our demo app, we, we do have state getters, actions, and mutations, but the big thing is we bring in our three modules that we'll use in this app, auth, collections, and restaurants, uh, just, just within that. And so it just treats them as part of the overall state object. Finally, this all comes together with component binding helpers, because as much as having all this happen in the background with our business logic and our data is really nice, not that helpful if our components can't automatically listen to it and if we're having to still manually trigger updates, manually fetch data. So just like there's state getters, actions, mutations, uh, in, in UX, our component binding helpers are all just mapping functions that map to those different things. And it lets us treat store data and methods as if they were part of our component, which is really nice. So with this, this is kind of our app container component here. You see that I bring in a change zone component, which is just a routing function, I use um, a string component name that I pass in to change this kind of component container. And then I'm also grabbing that user is logged in off, uh, or from the off store. So the second that we, we uh, call our mounted lifecycle hook, uh, we, we check if the user is logged in. And if they are, we, we change the home component from our off component to our restaurant there. Um, and we do that, as you can see, I'm not needing to 
do any crazy aliasing because of the namespacing of modules. I'm directly calling this dot users logged in, this dot change from component. In general, then this isn't like hard and fast rule because map state and map mutations do exist for a reason. Uh, that that it, there are some useful moments when you might want to directly access a mutation access state. For the most part, though, I, I kind of go with justify doing that because uh, you can probably do it through a getter or an action, and that's what getters and actions are for. Um, so as much as you could have one component directly call a mutation, if they're doing it with any extra business logic, now they're changing state in a different way than other components change state. You might need that, but overall, you probably want that consistency. Cool, demo time. Uh, so there's a few different things that I, I use to make dinner. The, the big ones that you'll see, uh, Firebase again for like auth and, and the data store, uh, just to sort of quickly spin up uh, that stuff without writing my own API. Um, and then I use Bootstrap View for the components, another sort of laziness thing where, sure, I could, I could write a form component, but I'm gonna let Bootstrap View take care of that. Uh, and then I use uh, the VS Code for my IDE, so. Dive into the code here. Make sure my server's up. Awesome. Cool. So, so I, I don't have a cool splash page or anything like that. We're, we're starting right from home component login state, and we'll we'll look at what that actually looks like uh, within within uh, our code. I'm going to change it to light theme just because it's, it's usually easier to see from a presentation standpoint, though I, I raise your hand if you actually develop in the light theme, because I, <laughs> really, nice, uh, cool, uh, it just, it hurts my eyes, uh, I don't, I don't, I don't know, but, but for presentations, it, it's, it's usually pretty helpful. I'm going to try to increase the font size here, too. Maybe, for them. There we go. Does that work for folks? Sweet. Cool, so again, we see this, this, this state object here. Uh, my various getters for that state object. Uh, my, my actions, here's my register action, just the stuff that we talked about before. Um, but now you can actually see it, how it's organized within the code. And then my mutations. Each one of them I, I call as objects, and then I export um, the, the entire thing just, just with it separated out. Um, objects. You can even have separate files for these if you want. If you 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 know decide that I have enough actions or, or getters or whatever to have their own files, you can import those and, and nest them that way too. Um, our main store looks like this. this. Is where actually we declare uh, the the constructor and actually initialize our store. Um, so that this it, it looks basically the same, other than it's hidden within a constructor. But but we're still defining objects that are that are uh, state getters actions. Cool. So uh, when we actually call our, our auth setup here, we've got uh, our auth component, which is a simple form. Uh, I do have a way to toggle, are we in register mode versus are we in login mode? Um, and then when I call uh, to, to register a user or to log in, I'm just checking which mode we're in. I grab those methods from the store because I use my component binding helpers up here. And then once we're done, uh, I check to make sure that we did have a successful login, and then we go to the home component. I don't have a whole lot of error handling in this. There's definitely a fair amount of do as I say, not as I do uh, within this as far as a real life app, but this is kind of your, your quick, let's get, let's get stuff on the screen. So for the purposes of this, we're gonna, we're gonna create a brand new account. Uh, we'll call it, yeah, we'll just call it Default Tender. This is a very complex password. It's definitely not test one, two, three. <laughs> uh, don't, we don't need to save this one. Cool. So once we're logged in, uh, we get into our, our restaurant picker. So we do have to do everything based on what city we're in. So the Zomato API kind of makes you enter by, by searching for a city first. I can already go into my restaurant list, but if I do that, we don't have any restaurants yet. Which makes sense, we're a brand new user. So, for now, uh, I'm, I'm going to choose a city that's not Denver, just in case anyone has family members at a restaurant. I'm, I'm going to like and dislike indiscriminately. Uh, so let's just go. Mm, let's go to Los Angeles. Why not? We'll look at uh, the most complex thing that the app does is, is within 
this action in our in our restaurant store to, to grab all the restaurants after grabbing the city. Uh, we'll take a look at that kind of last year in this whole thing. But here we see where, where we've got some metadata. We've got an image, the name of the restaurant, where it's located, stuff like that. Uh, and then using some great font awesome icons, we can like and dislike. So I'm just going to go through just to kind of fill our uh, list here for a second. It's, again, no offense to any of the restaurants that I dislike as much. Well, a little bit of offense. This is my stock image. And they have an average customer rating of zero. So uh, I'm not going to Cool. Uh, I should have enough info there. Before we jump over into looking at uh, our restaurant list, uh, let's take a look at, at our, our collections component, or collections store, which is what, what is going to hold on to all of these different lists. Real life API, I'm probably not going to store uh, my seen restaurants and my liked restaurants and my disliked restaurants any differently. Uh, I might have bullions, I'm going to join table, something in the back end to be able to, to, to store just the restaurant the one time. Uh, but in this case, because I'm using an external API, uh, Zomato doesn't care about this project, so it'll send me back the same restaurants all the time, and I need to somehow differentiate that this user liked these restaurants. They've already seen these restaurants. Don't pull them back again for me. So when we get a list, uh, we, we, just, we, we do have a payload here to determine what type of list it is. And if I want it, I can, I can dispatch other actions. I can commit a mutation, which we do actually in this case. I have access to uh, the local state object. Root state, which goes right up to the root node, and I can kind of traverse anywhere throughout my other stores uh, from root state. Uh, and then getters and root getters. So I set this loading. Uh, I know that I'm going to load lists a bunch. So I actually, within this store, have a, uh, a loading boolean. You could also do this as local state within your component. Um, this is definitely one of those just like, here's a thing you can do, uh, just, just in case you ever wanted to. So first, we, we, we grab that list from uh, Firebase. Firebase makes us call this dot dot data thing, which is a little inconvenient, but Whatever, we'll get over it. Uh, and then we uh, set that list, turn off loading. And so what that means is that the first time I go in here, we're going to default to to our liked restaurants. Actually, we can look at that uh, component real quick. We start in our mounting hook. We check to see uh, if if liked has been uh, fetched already. If it hasn't, uh, we're going to using a secret way. We're going to go grab that list. And then anytime I change, uh, I've got the ability to toggle between liked restaurant, dislike restaurant scene. Uh, we, we do the same thing of, of has that list been fetched already? If it hasn't, first time that we're getting into that list, we'll go grab it. But from there, after I do it the first time, all the updates and stuff, we should never need to see them. We'll see if I'm right about that. So in here, it's already been keeping track of liked restaurants because we were starting right from, from the root. Um, actually, I might log out completely in I don't remember this book. Look at all my different test updates. Was it developed at Denver? Thank you. Also, I, I gave myself the fun challenge of uh, I develop on a Mac at, at work and, and most of the time on a Mac, but, but I have this cool new uh, PC that's not super meant for development. It's probably oversuited for that, but I chose it's a Dell XPS. Uh, so I, I tried to do it here, but then, you know, command and control uh, are a little bit different. The keyboard, keyboard layout's a little bit different. Uh, you know, challenge mode for development, but why not? Cool, so now we're logging in fresh. We haven't fetched those lists yet. So for the first time, when I go over here, uh, actually, I might cache that. Let's really, I appreciate you helping out, UX, but I actually want this to be totally fresh. So now we're actually, we did have to go fetch our liked restaurants list. And then we can see all the different restaurants that we've, we've liked so far. We've got some, some sorting methods within the component. Um, definitely not, not you know, recreating the wheel with any of this stuff as much just sort of showing, you know, standard kind of list component things that, that you might see. Like if I just want to see Katia, there we go. We've got a little search filter. And now when I'm switching list types, so the first time I switch over to dislike, it's going to have to fetch that. So we see a little bit of loading. And when I go to C, uh, it's going to have to fetch that. 
But from there, as I go through, it remembers. I can, I can click back through liked, uh, disliked, all those things, uh, and, it, and it doesn't have to look. So finally, we're going to go back. Actually, I'm going to, real quick, let's see, Francisco this time. Show another, just, it's kind of one of those silly little state management tricks. In the same way that I have, I have the username here, uh, now that I actually have a city defined, now my top nav changes to give two options where we can change the city or uh, find restaurants again in San Francisco so that I don't have to reload all the restaurants for that city. And the reason I don't want to reload all those restaurants is because of the cost of my uh, get restaurant city search function. So uh, the interesting thing with the Zomato API before we look into the weird things I did with this code uh, is, is it only lets you get uh, 20 results per API call. And if your API call has more than 100, you can never access you know, indexes 100 and beyond. You only get uh, the first 100 results. So I needed to find some way because it's not my API, to somehow get unique results, not be grabbing three results at a time and continuing to reload our restaurant list. So my answer to that uh, was to create 20 different requests on the fly uh, to the Zomato API. So if we go from actually searching for our city, once we, once we grab a city and, and set the city within our store, then I go and grab categories. If it's the first time, categories are static within the Zomato API. So once I have them once, don't need to refresh them again. But cuisines are city specific, so every time I fetch a new city, I do need to go get the different cuisine types. And then from there, once I'm actually grabbing restaurants, uh, first, oh yeah, I, we check to see if we already have our list of scene restaurants. We need to do that because again, Tomato doesn't care about our app, and so it's going to pull back everything, and I need to filter out the stuff that we've already seen. Standard vanilla for loop, uh, just 20 times, all I do, uh, get a random index of categories, random in index of cuisines, and then I add them into my query uh, so that we get ideally 20 unique uh, cuisine and category combinations, each of those having up to 20 unique results so that we can get up to 400 restaurants from one call of Get Next Restaurants. Because I don't want to be doing this all the time. So we uh, promised that all over all, all of our restaurant requests, mostly because I don't care if they happen serially, I just want them to be done as quickly as possible. Uh, so I'm not using a single wait there. Uh, I guess I could use, I could await promise.all, but I'm just returning it in this case. And then once I get that, uh, I still need to see, um, there's there's just a little bit of flattening that you have to do from the Zomato API. And then once I have, because I have my C, I'm calling into root getters, going into collections, getting the total amount of C restaurants. So if there's zero, I don't really care about filtering, but since there's not zero, we're gonna go through, we're gonna filter, and if, if we've seen them, filter them out, filter them out of our results. And then, as much as it's great to have unique uh, cuisine and category combinations, I don't really want to give the user 20 sushi places, then 20 American places, then 20 Mexican places. So, uh, we do a quick little in-place shuffle. Uh, and then, we actually set it. If for whatever reason, uh, all the filtering and whatnot, we don't have restaurants after that, we, we just, we, we re recursively call it again and ideally, Granted, if you chose a small city, who without this is doing your handling right now, you would run into restaurants pretty quick. Uh, but ideally, uh, you're choosing a big restaurant, you can, you can actually see that. So yeah, on the fly, um, let's change our city. And now we'll do Denver. So we're going to send out 20 requests, do all the shuffling, all of that. And boom, now we're in Denver restaurants. And then the same, uh, even though we've changed that part of our store, Jumping back here, I don't need to reload my list because we've already loaded up. So yeah, there's our, our quick tour of the dinner app. I want to leave a little bit of time for, for questions and whatnot. Cool, so what do we see with this? Uh, again, uh, um, state, when we're talking about state management, it's a single tree, single object that represents all of our applications data and how that data changes. Your application, always gonna have state. You might not need to bring in a state management library if you're doing, like my own personal portfolio site, I don't have a state management library in mine because I'm just like, you're looking at my resume, you're not looking at my resume. I just don't really need to bring in UX to do that. But once you start getting into stuff like auth and, and API calls and stuff, I think you can make a pretty compelling reason that, that having something like this really helps you organize your code. Again, all the pieces of a, of a UX store, state, getters, actions, and mutations. 
um, and then kind of our, our uh, convenience things within Vuex uh, modules to help break up into different different types of stores, and then uh, our component binding helpers. And that's it. That's your that's your quick and dirty intro to Vuex. So yeah, any questions you guys have? We've got a good 10, 15 minutes here. Questions? Awesome. If you don't have a question, I'm not going to force questions on it. Uh, but yeah, thank you for coming out. Enjoy the other talks. Uh, if you weren't here at the beginning, um, the, one of the conveniences of dating a baker is that sometimes she comes home from the bakery uh, with a bunch of extra bacon. So on your way out, feel free to grab some cookies or some vodka. But oh, yeah, we got a question. So, actions are they automatically asynchronous, or do you have a bunch of promises or asynchronous way with it? Yeah, they're, they're not automatically asynchronous. So, so you can actually, I'll, I'll show you in my um, in my root store, the stuff like changing home component uh, and changing the route, I don't want to wait for that and I don't want it hidden behind a promise because I'm changing the component that's in view, I'm changing the route. So for those, uh, I, I actually don't wrap them in a promise or anything. They just straight up call router.push or commit that we're changing them. Uh, so if you, you, you do have the option to, to have your actions run synchronously, it's just, in most cases, especially if you're going to stay within the same component, you want that component to know, cool, data is updated, now you can do whatever else you want to do after. Yeah. Cool. Anything else? Sweet. Well, yeah, thank you again, and have a good rest of your development experience.